1914-1918. The Great War. The war to end all wars. The war that left 10 million dead. For four years, Europe had torn itself apart in a new kind of conflict, one of unprecedented violence. Total war on an industrial, global scale. The first act of a bloody 20th century. It was the final six months which proved decisive, when the Allies gained the upper hand over the Germans so that negotiations could begin at last offering a glimmer of hope for the millions of men who were fighting in appalling conditions. Among them was Augustin Trebuchon, a soldier in France's 415th Infantry Regiment. He too would see the end of the war, or nearly, since he had the sad privilege of taking part in the French Army's last battle, and to be the last man killed in combat. A tragic fate for a man who had signed up in August 1914 and who had gone through four years of deadly folly participating in the biggest battles. Trebuchon was one of the war's humble figures, the little guys. He was one of those millions of men who made history without knowing it. For his final mission, Trebuchon had to carry a message of hope to the front line. No one saw him fall. All that is known is that he was fatally wounded a few minutes before the armistice. The war started in 1914 as a national conflict typical of the 19th century. France, allied to the United Kingdom and Russia, faced the German, Austro-Hungarian and Ottoman empires in a conflict in which nationalism, the rise of imperialism and expansionist ambitions were the main causes of the outbreak of hostilities. After several months of fighting in a fast-moving war, a front was established between the two sides, which didn't really move for the next three years. The balance shifted in 1917 when Russia and the United States, the two powers that would become the principal players of the 20th century, changed the terms of their engagement in the conflict. In March 1917, Tsar Nicholas II abdicated in the face of revolutionary pressure from the Bolsheviks. Russia ended up signing a peace treaty with the Germans a year later, on the 3rd of March, 1918. German troops posted on the Eastern Front returned to fight in France. In the spring of 1918, the Germans made spectacular advances into French territory and came within 40 miles of Paris. It was the return of a war of movement. But the balance of power shifted when the United States entered the war in April 1917, after several of their ships were torpedoed by the Germans. From then on, they sent growing numbers of troops to the European front. By the summer of 1918, there were more than a million US soldiers involved. Thanks to their support, the Allies managed to counter the German advance and won a series of victories in the spring of 1918. From July, the German command lost any hope of dictating the terms of peace. The Second Battle of the Marne marked a definitive turnaround in the military situation. The German army was forced to retreat and the Allies regained ground. This was the start of what was called the victorious pursuit the Allied armies thrust to drive the Germans out of France. In September 1918, Augustin Trebuchon was in the area of Reims with his regiment, the 415th, an elite regiment which wore the berry of the Alpine hunters when not in combat.
For the past 20 days, the men of the 415th had been camped near Mormolo. Morale in the ranks was high. The arrival of the Americans and the recent Allied victories had given the soldiers renewed courage, and the first rumors that an end was in sight began to circulate. Not much is known about Trebuchon. A native of Lozère in southeastern France, he was a communal shepherd and the oldest of six children, becoming the mainstay of the family following his parents' death. At the age of 36, he could have been exempt from conscription, but nonetheless chose to sign up. His service record mentions that he was wounded twice. During the previous four years of war, he only took leave once to return to his home in Malzieu-Forin, the village where he was born. Family members recalled that on the eve of returning to the front, he showed a certain disquiet. back on the move again. What's up, Gasser? We're just fine here. What do you expect, old chap? You better not get too comfortable. That's life. Go on! Gather round. We're on the move, and this time it's good, lads. And empty your kid out. You'd better travel light during the pursuit. Come on, Trebuchon, get moving. You'll see your kid again in a fortnight. Don't worry, the Americans aren't here in numbers yet. Oh uh, yeah, for sure. We won't do anything without them. We'll go and fire a few rounds up there, two weeks at the most. We'll be back here for rest, that's for sure. Four hundred and fifteenth Regiment, move out! Like many other regiments, the 415th went back into combat. All along the front, the Allied domination was confirmed and the Germans fell back. In the rest of Europe, the Central Empires were also losing ground. British forces liberated the Arab countries from Ottoman rule. In the Balkans, the French army put paid to an already much weakened Bulgarian army. And on the 29th of September, Bulgaria signed the armistice. The Austro-Hungarian Empire was gradually driven back by Italian forces and would sign a peace treaty. At Spa in Belgium, where the German army had set up its headquarters, the gravity of the situation was beginning to sink in. The head of the German armed forces, Paul von Hindenburg, and his great strategist, Erich von Ludendorff, realized that the coalition formed around Germany was starting to fall apart. It soon became very clear to them that a German victory was now impossible. Wir müssen einen Waffenstillstand fragen. Die Armee darf nicht zugrunde gehen. Es ist das Ende. Wir stehen kurz für eine Katastrophe. Ich kann das Schicksal meiner Armee nicht dem Zufall überlassen. Wir müssen schnellstmöglich in Verhandlungen mit Präsident Füllsen treten. Ich werde den Kaiser verständigen. The German leadership turned to the Americans to begin negotiations for peace. They hoped to obtain more favorable conditions than they would get from the French or British. The US President Woodrow Wilson was an idealist. He didn't intend to impose excessive humiliation on the defeated German nation. 
The 14 points that he set out on the 18th of January as the basis for peace negotiations were more of a manifesto laying out a vision of the world founded on free trade and the freedom of nations rather than a concrete plan for disarmament or military negotiation. Wilson was wary of Clemenceau's intransigence, so he did not involve the other allies before engaging in talks. The Germans' first step to fall in line with Wilson's wishes was to appoint as Chancellor Max von Baden, a liberal who had the backing of the Reichstag and who for several months had made no secret of his anti-militarist position. But from the end of that September until November, which would see an end to the conflict, six weeks of fierce negotiations took place to thrash out the conditions for peace. Trébuchon was a messenger. It was his job to transmit communications that had to be circulated between the lines. Among the troops, the foot soldiers called them runners. It was a high-risk mission, which required good knowledge of where each unit was positioned, as well as where the shelters could be found in case of bombardment. On the 5th of October, the 415th had captured the Mont saint nord the hill with no name and the Germans had abandoned their lines. Their next objective was Pont Faverger, a small village about 13 miles north of their current position. All along the front, the Allies had made significant advances. As for the German army, despite being destabilized by these territorial gains, it was at the height of its power. It was thus that the German admirals did not seek the approval of the politicians before taking a decision which would have disastrous consequences they relaunched the submarine war. On the 10th of October, an Irish civilian postal ship was torpedoed, resulting in 570 dead, including two American citizens. This was too much. President Wilson was outraged and shifted his view of the negotiations, now taking a much harder line on the Germans. Things were now a long way from the conciliatory tone of his 14 points. Before anything else, he demanded an immediate military capitulation to make any resumption of hostilities on the part of the Germans impossible. But above all, Wilson no longer wanted to negotiate with Kaiser Wilhelm II, whom he saw as an autocrat surrounded by a cast of military men and not a politician representing the German people. If the United States of America are to deal with autocratic monarchs and military governments, then the United States of America cannot enter in peace negotiations, but must demand Germany's unconditional surrender. I see no point in not saying it. Send this note at once to Berlin and to the press agencies. The American demands came as a bombshell to the German political class. Chancellor Max von Baden, who wanted to enter a viable peace process, launched the idea of a new constitution with the aim of transforming Germany's old military monarchy into a democratic parliamentary regime. But Kaiser Wilhelm II, furious at seeing his legitimacy challenged, instead became more entrenched in his bellicose position and hid behind his military chiefs, who categorically refused Wilson's conditions. In an act of wartime folly, Ludendorff, second in command of the German army, telegraphed his chiefs of staff with orders for all-out resistance, calling on their men to fight to the bitter end and to apply a scorched earth policy if forced to retreat. In the corridors of the Reichstag, feelings were running high. In the politicians' view, the military caste was undermining the armistice negotiations. For the Social Democrats, whose influence was growing following the appointment of Max von Baden, Ludendorff was out of control and had become a danger. 
So Matthias Etzberger, then Minister of Foreign Affairs, who was still mourning the death of his son in combat, managed to convince the Kaiser of the need to reshuffle his chiefs of staff. Oheit, brechen Sie die Verhandlungen mit Filson ab. Rufen Sie das gesamte Volk zum Kampf auf. Noch ist Zeit zu handeln. Zu spät. Und Sie konterkarieren meine Politik mit Ihren Verlautbarungen. Niemand hat unsere Armee besiegt. Deutschland leidet. Weil Sie versagt haben. Und weil die Regierung aus laut Feiglingen besteht. Sie sprechen mit Ihrem Kaiser. Vergessen Sie es nicht. Die sind nichts als ein geschlagener General, Ludendorff. Wenn dies Ihre Ansicht ist, sollte ich mich besser zurückziehen. Das ist Ihre Entscheidung. Allein Ihre Entscheidung. On the 27th of October, the Germans sent their final communication to Washington. It accepted all the conditions demanded by the United States. For their part, Allied statesmen in Europe had, for the past month, grown exasperated by President Wilson's attitude towards them. Clemenceau, Lloyd George, the British Prime Minister, and Orlando, the Italian Premier, could not countenance the armistice being negotiated without them. Colonel Haas, President Wilson's envoy, arrived in Paris with the delicate mission of convincing the Allies to back the American conditions for peace. Colonel Haas, voilà plus de trois semaines que vous négociez avec les Allemands, sans nous avoir une seule fois consulté sur ces 14 points. Nous ne sommes pas d'accord. Il convient à présent de poser nos conditions. Hmm. Je vous comprends, messieurs, mais faites attention. Si vous n'adhérez pas aux 14 points, le président Wilson pourrait poursuivre seul les négociations avec les Allemands. Nous reprendrons la séance demain, messieurs. Lloyd George wanted to maintain the maritime blockade against Germany, which the Americans wanted to lift to encourage the resumption of international trade. Clemenceau demanded even more severe conditions than Wilson. In his view, Germany should be brought to its knees. By now, it was widely known that peace negotiations were underway, and on the battlefields, the pace of fighting was slowing. Hey, Gaza, so, any news? There's good news, old pal. What's that? Turkey signed the amnesty. Turkey? What the hell do I care about Turkey? When's it our turn for an amnesty? Keep the noise down. At the end of October, the 415th Infantry Regiment, Trebuchon's Regiment, was approaching the Meuse, still hard on the heels of the retreating Germans. While they waited for the next orders to attack, the soldiers took care of their sore feet. They patched up holes in their greatcoats, sewed on a few buttons, and made sure to grease their weapons. Others took the time to send news from the front back home to their families. Some, as they dug their individual foxholes for the night, unearthed rabbits from their warrens. A welcome addition to the evening's stockpot. They made the best of these rare moments of respite. Hey, chaps, we attack at six o'clock tomorrow. I have to take this to the captain. On the 31st of October, the Allies finally managed to sit down at the same table to reach an agreement. They met at the Trianon Palace in Versailles for several days of intense discussions. But this time, progress was made, and on the 4th of November, the Allies finally agreed on the definitive wording of the conditions of the armistice they wanted to impose on Germany. For the first time, an end to the conflict seemed to all of them as not only possible, 
but imminent. Captain, don't go first. Let someone else. Trebuchon will go. Unarmed. Where the hell did he come from? What are you doing here? Answer! I'm lost. It's quite a mess. Who's your commanding officer? Answer the captain, Kraut. Amostin. Amos what? Wait, let him speak. Don't shoot. I don't want to go back to the front. I'm surrendering. Interrogated by the men of the 415th, the young German revealed that his division now only had 30 men per company and that the general opinion among his comrades was that the war wouldn't go on for more than another fortnight, and that sooner or later, the emperor would abdicate. The following morning, more exhausted Germans came to surrender to Trebuchon's regiment. The prisoners told them that an officer had been shot during the night by soldiers opposed to the continuation of the fighting. In fact, Opposition to the war was growing across the whole of Germany. On the 3rd of November, in the German port of Kiel, 50,000 sailors mutinied. Riots were breaking out in many places. Soldiers joined the protest movement. The tension was rising, shooting broke out, resulting in several dead. In Berlin, the Spartacus League, a communist movement inspired by the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, was growing in influence and the German government was increasingly fearful that the country would tip into revolution. It was against this backdrop that the Germans found themselves contacted by the Allies, who were at last in a position to negotiate. Given the country's catastrophic situation, Max von Baden didn't take long to come to a decision. And so, on the 6th of November, in Paris, on the third floor of the Eiffel Tower, a crew of the radio telegraphy service received a message over the airwaves. The Germans agreed to enter into contact with the Allies. Marshal Foch, Supreme Commander of the Allied Armies, was chosen to lead the armistice negotiations with the Germans. Along with his number two, General Végan, he decided to organize the meeting on the outskirts of Compiègne, north of Paris, where his train was brought to a halt in the middle of the forest, in the clearing of Rotonde. Das Abkommen muss schnell getroffen werden. Die Armee braucht Ruhe. Doch so wollen sie so viel für das Vaterland zu erwecken wie möglich. On the German side, the Secretary of State Matthias Edsberger was appointed to lead the armistice negotiations with the Allies. He prepared to cross the French lines. Sound the ceasefire. Let them pass unharmed. The convoy of plenipotentiaries crossed the lines. Once on the French side, they were welcomed by Major de Bourbon Busset. He was charged with taking them to the Rotonde clearing to meet Marshal Foch. Permettez-moi une question, commandant. Le nom de Monsieur le Maréchal. 
Doit-on le prononcer Foch ou Foch Foch. La route a été bombardée par votre artillerie. Nous n'avons pas eu le temps de la remettre en état. Où sommes-nous À Ternier. Il n'en reste rien. The 8th of November. Trebuchon's regiment reached Dorlemignil on the Meuse, not far from the Franco-Belgian border. They liberated the village which had been occupied by the Germans for 52 months. The locals emerged cautiously from their cellars, where they had taken refuge during the shelling, and welcomed the soldiers as saviors. The few houses still standing were little more than ghostly silhouettes, testifying to the ferocity of the fighting. Dolomignil was a strategic objective which the 415th Regiment had been aiming to take for a fortnight. Now that the position was held and the enemy had been driven back to the other side of the Meuse, the men were convinced that they would no longer have to advance and they could finally have some rest. Yesterday, you have captured 10,000 Germans. My goodness, they really put us through it. He's a stout soul. Look at my windows. They're all broken, my doors torn off, my floor ripped up for firewood, as if we're sort of wood in these parts. It was a lovely house. It's such a shame. I understand how you feel, old fellow. Huh, they're pretty handy when it comes to wrecking everything, that's for sure. Ow! I can't see how we can go through this time. We can't! You can see we're stuck here. The engineers are at least five days' march away. Anyway, let's not be in a rush. We've been on their heels for a month now. They're not going to make us keep on galloping forever. You can put your kit down, lads. We're not about to go anywhere, I'm telling you. Ow! <laughs> Messieurs, les plénipotentiaires sont là. Nous allons pouvoir commencer. Je n'ai pas de proposition à vous faire. Monsieur le maréchal, comment voulez-vous que nous nous exprimions Nous pourrions dire que nous demandons les conditions de l'armistice. Je n'ai pas de conditions à soumettre. Nous nous référons à la note du président Wilson, mm -hmm. selon laquelle le maréchal Foch est autorisé à nous communiquer les conditions de l'armistice. Oui, je suis autorisé à vous faire connaître ces conditions si vous demandez l'armistice. Demandez-vous l'armistice Oui. Dans ce cas, le général Végan va vous lire les clauses principales. Matthias Erzberger had the conditions of the armistice that the Allies had agreed at the Trianon Palace read out to him and was left stunned. He was not expecting such harsh terms and could not imagine signing such a document without the approval of his government. But in the rush, he'd forgotten to bring with him a telegrapher capable of sending coded messages. 
so he was forced to send an emissary to Spa to inform the German chiefs of staff of the wording. Erzberger wanted to cease hostilities there and then, but Foch refused as long as the armistice wasn't yet signed. The Germans had three days. At 11 o'clock, on the 11th day of the 11th month, they had to give their response. There would be no ceasefire until the set time. In a twist of fate, this delay provided the Allies with the opportunity to resume operations in the field. Fearing a possible refusal by the German government, Foch decided to relaunch an offensive in Lorraine, intended to deal a fatal blow to the enemy if they chose to continue the war. At this stage of negotiations, no one had ruled out that fighting could resume with this offensive. Don't get carried away, Leluc. You've been drinking again. That's it! We're going home! You'll see your sweetheart again, Trubish. Don't listen to him. It's just more kitchen gossip. It's not! It was the chaplain who told me! Don't think about it. You'll regret you ever believed it. The 9th of November. While the German government still knew nothing of the conditions of the armistice, Berlin was now in the grip of a full-blown revolution. The Kaiser wanted to march on the capital to put down the revolt by force. But he was growing increasingly isolated. Tens of thousands of workers rallied by leaders of the Spartacus League demonstrated in the streets of Berlin to demand his abdication. Shooting broke out. It was Red Saturday. Max von Baden no longer had any choice. Under pressure from the Social Democrats, he drew up the declaration of the Kaiser's abdication without the latter's approval. The text was posted up throughout the city. With the crowd starting to invade the chancellery, Friedrich Ebert, a moderate social democrat, was immediately appointed chancellor in place of von Baden. The German Empire had fallen. Mein Rücktritt wurde nicht rechtskräftig beschlossen. Dieser Max von Baden hat die Regierung in die Hände der Sozialisten gegeben. Ich hätte diese Revolution an der Spitze meines Heeres bezwingen können. Hoheit, Sie müssen gehen. Diese Hunde von Sozialdemokraten haben uns verraten! The political upheaval in Germany worried the Allies, since they no longer knew if they could consider the plenipotentiaries as representing the new German Republic or not. Faced with this uncertainty, the Allies made final preparations for the offensive in Lorraine to be ready for the 14th of November. The attack was intended to make the German army definitively submit, and some of the generals even thought it would allow them to penetrate onto German soil and score a resounding victory. The French chiefs of staff did not approve of such a radical campaign, but conceded that the more the enemy was weakened, the more negotiations would go to their advantage. On the ground, the orders were clear. The troops must advance. Send this message. Regroup your army and stand ready to cross the Meuse. I repeat, regroup your army and stand ready to cross the Meuse. Monitor enemy activity to exploit the most advantageous moment to cross the Meuse. I'll send the message immediately. No, no, wait for the orders. Captain, the high command for you. We have to cross the Meuse tonight, Captain, by any means and at any cost. But, General, the men are exhausted. We have no intelligence on the enemy's strength on the other side of the river. The artillery no, no. isn't ready yet. The Germans think they're safe on the far bank. We have to sap their morale with an audacious act. We'll find a way to cross whatever it costs.
On your feet, we're moving out. Huh? Muster in five minutes. We're crossing the Meuse tonight, lads. What? The Lieutenant, without planes or tanks, without artillery, we'll be massacred. Those are our orders, Delalugue. Don't question it. <sighs> You'd better hold on until the reinforcements get here. For the 415th, the orders were unequivocal. By the morning of the 10th of November, they must have crossed the Meuse by whatever means. The sacrifice that the men of the 415th were asked to make that day meant that the prospect of imminent peace had to be concealed from them so that they could maintain a fighting spirit right up until the last minute. Maintenant que la République est proclamée en Allemagne, avez-vous toujours les pouvoirs pour signer l'armistice De toute manière, il faudra bien signer. In Berlin, the new government learned the terms of the armistice, which were very harsh. On top of the immediate cessation of hostilities and a withdrawal from invaded countries, Germany was required to hand over to the Allies its military and industrial apparatus. Had to accept the occupation by the Allies of its territory. And besides a maritime blockade, it was forced to hand over all its ships, despite the risk of this plunging the country into famine. The terms were harsh, but the new government, still facing unrest in the streets and the threat of the Spartacus League, swiftly agreed. At the same time, Parisians came out into the street to celebrate the victory. Gendarmes dispersed the crowd. Go on home, it's not over. Shout! Shout! Sunday, the 10th of November, the 415th had made it across, but the fog was lifting and the footbridge was being permanently bombarded by the German artillery, stopping the regiment from pulling back. The reinforcements had not yet arrived and were held up by the state of the roads. The soldiers were caught in a trap between the Meuse and the railway lines, behind which the regiment had dug in for protection from machine gun fire. Since the link to dans le Menil had been cut, the men could not be supplied with ammunition they nonetheless received orders to hold the bridgehead on the other bank at all costs. Je sais qu'après ces trois jours et trois nuits de travail, vous êtes bien fatigué. Il faut pourtant tenir le coup, messieurs. Car c'est la dernière nuit et je ne veux pas que le sang d'un soldat soit versé inutilement après l'heure. On the 11th of November at 2.15 in the morning, the plenipotentiaries finally received the approval of the new government. Je le découvre, tapez tout de suite le dernier feuillet et laissez la moitié en blanc pour les signatures. At 5.15 in the morning, the armistice was signed. On all the fronts, the ceasefire was to be sounded at 11 o'clock. Messieurs, c'est la paix. Voici les signatures. Vous serez les premiers à les voir. Tenez, messieurs, vous l'avez bien mérité. À votre santé, mon général. At 5.40, the Eiffel Tower received the message announcing the news. During the morning, the Echo du Nord newspaper rushed out a special edition, Germany is defeated, the armistice signed. In Paris, the paper flies off the newsstands. Crowds start to flood onto the streets. The news spreads from one end of the city to the other. André! Here. Huh? Let's go. In New York, the crowds celebrate in the street. The 
in Germany. While some take the news as a humiliation, the great majority of the German people are relieved by the announcement of an end to the war. It's over! In France, in the towns and villages, people start to hang flags from the windows. I don't believe it. What's going on, Lieutenant? Let me see. <sighs> oh. In the streets, everyone is bursting with indescribable joy at the idea that four years of war have finally come to an end. On all the fronts, the soldiers of the Allied armies cry victory. I can't believe it! I can't believe it! <laughs> Read me that telegram! Come and get it! Oh, give me that telegram! <laughs> Come and get it! Come back here! Hey, grab my telegram! Is it really over? <laughs> Can we go home? Get along, transmit this message right away to the battalion commander. Get a move on, old chap. And you type it out for the messengers. Hurry up, gentlemen, hurry up. We don't have much time left. Meanwhile, the 415th Regiment was still stuck on the far bank of the Meuse and had not yet received the message about the end of the combat. For these soldiers, the most important thing was to hold their position. At that moment, as the announcement of the armistice ran up and down the 550 kilometers of front line, Trebuchon's division was the only French unit engaged in fighting and cut off from its rear supply lines. Gazareth, messenger with the 3rd Battalion, I've just come from the front. We've lost all lines of communication. Captain Le Breton has sent me back for orders. There are no more orders, old chap. What? Here, take this to your captain. And hey, take care out there. Yes, sir. Signed the armistice. Bonval, find me the messengers. Messengers, go to the captain! Messengers, go to the captain! Messengers, go to the captain! I need a bugler. I know one, Captain. Bugler de la Lune. We were assigned together to the 415th. We were photographed together. Well, go and fetch him then. Uh, yes, Captain. Take this to your unit commander. Hey, mind how you go, sir. La Luc, where's La Luc? What do you want with La Luc? I need a bugler. He's in the hole behind the bank. Over there. We 
have to sound a ceasefire, old chap. Huh? What? A ceasefire? A ceasefire. Very good, Captain. But, uh, I've forgotten how the ceasefire goes. The last time I played it was on the Fiery Rage 1911. I think I yes, remember. yes, that'll do. Listen carefully. You shoot like a pig. You're getting no leave. Got it? Yeah. Damn, there's no mouthpiece. Well, what's going on now? Well, I can't find my mouthpiece. Well, hurry up and find it. Hold on, I'm, I'm losing my marbles. I have to find that damn mouthpiece. Ah, there it is. Are you ready? Ready, Captain. You have to play it standing up. The orders are categorical. What? Standing? Think it's over? Paris, 1,200 cannon blasts were sounded to announce the end of hostilities. The church bells rang out continuously. Everyone poured into the streets. The terraces of the Tuileries Gardens and the Place de la Concorde were thick with people. In the skies above, planes performed aerobatics. The city was draped in flags. A wave of joy swept across Paris. of the villagers, the 415th carried the dead to the little church of Vrigne-Meuse on the other bank of the river. 33 were killed on the 11th. Officially, the 415th recorded no losses on the 11th of November 1918. Yet these men did indeed die for France on that day. But their deaths were predated to the 10th of November, as if the operation had never existed. According to the military authorities, it was quite simply not possible to die for France on the day of the armistice, the day of victory. The 415th was the only regiment of the French army in combat in the minutes ahead of the armistice. The order to attack had clearly been issued by military leaders who had little regard for the survival of their soldiers as if the fate of the little guy scarcely had any importance in the eyes of the great. Rally at 11.30 in Dorlemenil for rations. It was with this order clenched in his hand that Trebuchon had been found lifeless, his face 
blooded. André Gazaret found his comrade's body a few moments after the ceasefire had sounded. Augustin Trebuchon was the last Frenchman killed in the First World War. Trebuchon's name can be found on the war memorial in the village of Vrigne-Meuse. It is there, among so many others, saved from oblivion by the absurd chance of being the last to die. The tragic irony of Trebuchon's fate also finds an echo in the context of the end of the war. The pointlessness of his death calls into question all the victims of the Great War, who died in a conflict which did not result in lasting peace. German nationalism, fed by a thirst for revenge, was still a potent force. The tensions which run through Europe, far from being extinguished, were merely calmed in 1918, only to burst forth again 20 years later. The First World War, the war to end all wars, was in fact merely the first act. <laughs> <laughs>